As a logic programmer, you may at one point wonder what is logic. And logic is a very broad and also interesting and beautiful topic. And in fact, there is no universally accepted definition of what logic actually is. However, what we can say is that logic is concerned, at least among other things, with the properties of and the relations between syntax, that is the formalization of languages according to rules. This includes, for example, defining what a formula or a sentence looks like. And I mean, not only in natural languages, but also, and in fact, even especially in formal languages. Semantics, that is assigning meaning to the syntactic constructs of these languages. So um, this includes, for example, defining how sentences are interpreted and stating under what conditions they are true. For example, a sentence that is true under all possible interpretations is called valid. And of course, there are relations between sentences. So for instance, if a sentence A is always true, if sentence B is true, then A is called a semantic consequence of B. And inferences. This stems from the Latin verb inferre, which means to carry forward. And an inference rule allows us to derive logical consequences from premises. So to bring or carry forward premises to conclusions. Now, there are different kinds of inferences. For example, in statistics, we can make inferences that take uncertainty into account. So we can make probabilistic inferences. As another example, there are inductive inferences, where we try to generalize what we have observed. And we focus here on deductive inferences. This means that we draw conclusions by virtue of the syntactic structure of statements. A proof is a finite sequence of such inferences, starting from a set of axioms and ending with what we call a theorem. And of course, ideally, the inference rules are defined in such a way that everything that can be derived with the rules, so every theorem, is a semantic consequence of the axioms. And this property is called strong soundness. And also, it is great if the converse also holds. So it is, of course, great if every semantic consequence can be derived by syntactic inferences as a theorem. And this property is called strong completeness. For example, consider two statements. Statement A is it is an apple. And statement B is, it is a banana. Now, suppose I tell you A or B is the case. So either it is an apple or it is a banana or both. So A or B. And in addition, I tell you it is not an apple. So not A. Then you can conclude by logical reasoning that it is a banana. So B. And intuitively, this is a sound inference, which means that the conclusion is a semantic consequence of the premises. But to really show that this is sound, you would, of course, have to consider the actual semantics of these formulae. So using, for example, the semantics of propositional logic. And in this notation, we write the premises above the bar and the conclusion below it. And What's notable is that this inference doesn't depend on the content of A and B. In fact, it doesn't even depend on the truth of the premises. So we can regard this form of an inference as a general inference rule that is sound, no matter what the statements actually say and whether they hold. What matters is only the structure of the statements. So this concrete combination of a disjunction and a negation. So this means that every time we see this pattern, we can derive the conclusion. And in fact, this inference rule is quite famous and 
even has its own name. This is called disjunctive syllogism, also known as modus tolendo ponens. So the mode that affirms by denying. And a key attraction of inference rules is, of course, this connection between syntactic derivations and semantic consequences. Because a sound inference rule is truth-preserving. That is, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. And if this is ensured by the inference rules, then we don't have to think about the meaning of these statements. And we can instead simply apply the inference rules automatically. And in sequent notation, we can write this inference rule as from A or B and not A, we can derive B. This symbol here is read as proves or entails syntactically. So this means that B is provable from A or B and not A. So this is an example of an inference rule that we can adopt and every time we encounter such a pattern, we can apply the inference rule. And one of the tasks of logicians is to devise suitable formalisms to express what is needed and to define sensible inference rules, to reason about the statements that can be expressed. And a suitable formalization is sometimes not obvious, so even coming up with a fitting notation can be quite hard. For instance, as our second example, consider the statement, this dog is a pug and the dog is yours. Then a semantic consequence of this is obviously that this is your pug. And this symbol here is read as models or entails semantically. And analogously, if the dog is a Labrador and it is yours, then it follows that this is your Labrador. So it may at first seem that there is a clear pattern here and that we can introduce an inference rule that states, if we see a statement of the form, this dog is a C, where C stands for some class of dogs, such as a breed, and the dog is yours, then we can derive that this is your C. And from our two examples, this seems plausible. So what we have done here is we have made an inductive inference to come up with a deductive rule because we have looked at our two concrete examples and derived a single inference rule that captures both cases. But unfortunately, this doesn't work as intended because if we allow such an inference, then we can derive from this dog is a father and the dog is yours, the statement, this is your father. So obviously this inference rule is unsound because there are cases where the premises hold, but the conclusion doesn't. Now, all of this, of course, raises several questions, such as what can we express, which sentences are true, which deductions are sound, and what can we prove? And depending on which syntactic formalisms and which semantics we use, we arrive at different logics. And let's now consider a few such logics. One very well-known logic is propositional logic. For instance, the apple and banana example that we considered used syntax, semantics, and an inference rule from propositional logic. And in this logic, you can reason about truth values, true and false, atomic propositions, such as A, B, C, and about relations between them, such as A and B, A or B, A implies B, and so on, and about their relations. And this logic can express all problems in the complexity class NP, in the sense that for every instance of a problem in NP, you can construct, even in polynomial time, and therefore also in polynomial space, a formula in propositional logic that is satisfiable if and only if the instance is a yes instance. So from this it follows that satisfiability of propositional formulas is as hard as the hardest problems in NP. 
And in fact, propositional satisfiability was also the first problem proved to be NP-complete. Another very important logic is predicate logic. For our purposes as Prolog programmers, this is the most important formalism. And we will also consider it in more detail separately. Predicate logic is a family of logics. One way to categorize them is to group them by their order. So for example, we have first order predicate logic. This is one of the most important logics and arguably even the most important logic. Predicate logic is a generalization of propositional logic. So it includes propositional logic as a subformalism. And in addition to atomic propositions, predicate logic provides terms and predicates to allow much more finely grained statements about our domains of interest. So for instance, we can use this formalism to express that some property holds for an individual or that a relation holds between some individuals or that one property of an individual implies another property or a relation and so on. And importantly, we can quantify over individuals. So we can express that for all individuals of our domain, a property holds or that there exists an individual such that a property or a relation holds and so on. And first order predicate logic is quite powerful. Notably, we can describe how a Turing machine works in this logic. That means that for any given Turing machine, we can construct a first order formula that describes what the Turing machine does in the sense that every possible state of the machine corresponds to a semantic consequence of the description and vice versa. And in particular, for every given Turing machine, we can also construct a first order formula that is valid if and only if the Turing machine holds. And from this, it follows that in first order predicate logic, validity and therefore also satisfiability are in general not decidable. So this is in contrast to propositional logic, where satisfiability is NP-complete and therefore decidable. But on the plus side, this means that first-order predicate logic is expressive enough to describe all possible computations, in the sense that results of the computation are semantic consequences of the description. And importantly, first-order predicate logic is strongly complete. So we can derive all semantic consequences by syntactic inferences. And from this, it follows that validity and therefore also unsatisfiability are semi-decidable in first-order predicate logic because we can simply systematically search for proofs. And if a sentence is valid, we will find a proof. So this means that we can use first-order predicate logic as a formal basis for computation. Then there are second and higher order logics. The order of a logic denotes what we can quantify. In first order logics, we can quantify over individuals. So we can formulate statements such as for each individual, some property holds. In second order logics, we can also quantify over relations between domain elements. So we can express, for example, for each predicate, some statement holds. And in higher order logics, we can quantify over relations between such relations and so on. So in this sense, propositional logic can be regarded as a zero order logic because it doesn't support quantifiers. And importantly, and in fact as a quite general principle and logic, increased expressiveness has a price. So the increased expressiveness of being able to quantify over relations is of course useful and as we will see even necessary to express several important concepts in a definitive way. But we pay a price for it. And in this case, the price is that 
reasoning about the sentences in this logic becomes much harder. In fact, reasoning in second and higher order logics becomes so hard in general that determining whether a sentence is valid is not even semi-decidable, but truly undecidable. So this is a major difference to first order predicate logic where due to its completeness, every valid sentence can be derived syntactically. So this is one way to classify logics according to their order. Another way to characterize logics is to make a distinction between classical and non-classical logics. And classical means propositional and predicate logic as found in Gottlob Frege's Begriffsschrift. So we are not referring to classical antiquity, but to 19th and 20th century inventions. Some characteristic properties that hold in classical logic are the law of the excluded middle, so either A or not A holds, so no third option is given, tertium non datur, commutativity of conjunction, this means that A and B implies B and A, law of non-contradiction, so it is never the case that both A and its negation hold, and several other properties that seem obvious. However, in some situations, you need different foundational laws. For instance, consider the law of the excluded middle, either A or not A. Um, this seems plausible enough, right? However, it doesn't apply in all situations. For example, suppose we are reasoning about proofs of mathematical theorems then we may be in a situation where we have no proof of some conjecture, okay? But that does not mean that we have a proof of the negation of the conjecture. It may even be the case that there is no proof for the conjecture and at the same time that there is also no proof for its negation. So this is an example where we need to remove this principle to correctly reason about the situation. And this symbol here denotes that something is not a semantic consequence. In this case, not a semantic consequence of the empty theory. So this means that A or not A is not valid. When we take A to mean we are able to prove A and not A to mean we are able to refute A, so to prove its negation. And different foundational laws lead to different logics, which are called non-classical logics. For example, the case we have just mentioned, where for example the law of the excluded middle doesn't hold, arises in a very important non-classical logic called intuitionistic logic. As another example, there is the large group of modal logics. This includes, for instance, temporal logic, where we can reason about things that change over time. So in this logic we can express and reason about statements such as if some measure is taken then a particular situation cannot arise in the future or always arises in the future and so on. As another example of a modal logic, epistemic logic lets us reason about knowledge. And this can be very useful for example in legal situations because in this logic, we can formalize statements such as the attorney knew that the witness didn't know something and so on. Then there are many valued logics such as Wukashevich logic and fuzzy logic where true and false are not the only truth values. As another example of non-classical logics, substructural logics lack one of the so-called structural rules of classical logic, such as contraction or exchange. For example, linear logic lets us conveniently reason about resource-sensitive issues. So for instance, a resource may be consumed only once and is then no longer available. And there are many other logics with different notations and associated semantics. And such differences must of course also be reflected in the corresponding inference systems if we want them to be sound. And if you think about it, then 
this situation is a bit similar to programming languages because one reason to pick a logic is that it may be most suitable for your domains of interest, just as you would pick, for example, Prolog or Postscript depending on the task. So in analogy to programming languages, depending on the situation, it may, for example, be an advantage to have particular inference rules available as a built-in feature, so to say, instead of having to simulate them. And as another useful analogy, we can say that the relation between logic and computer science is comparable to the relation between mathematics and physics, in the sense that logic helps us to express and reason about the things we are interested in as programmers. Now, how does logic relate to Prolog? First of all, Prolog is a programming language and Prolog is based on a Turing complete subset of predicate logic. Prolog is mostly confined to first order logic, but it also supports a few higher order and meta logical features. For example, we can use Prolog to initiate an encrypted network connection over the internet. And such actions are called side effects because we use them for their effect rather than their logical meaning. Prolog's execution mechanism can be regarded as a specific form of theorem proving, namely as a special case of resolution. So you can think of the execution mechanism as deriving logical consequences of a program. However, the variant of resolution that is used by Prolog is incomplete in the sense that not all logical consequences of a program are derived in general. Why is this? Richard O'Keefe, the author of a great Prolog book, said it best. Prolog is an efficient programming language because it is a very stupid theorem prover. So the reason for this trade-off is of course efficiency. We get an efficient programming language at the cost of logical completeness. However, you can of course use Prolog to implement any theorem prover you like, precisely because it is a programming language. And in fact, among many other applications, Prolog is often used for implementing theorem provers. So you can easily implement a complete search strategy or any strategy you like within Prolog. 